Our next scripture reading comes from Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked at him, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Our scripture passage um, comes to us today, um, right after Peter has said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus goes on to talk about how that will come about um, in terms of his suffering and his death. And Peter's like, oh no, not that way. Um, and Jesus asks um, him not so kindly to get thee behind me, Satan. Um, so we're at this moment where Christ has been teaching who he is and what he is about. And as much as the disciples, and we want that, we also still want the way that we think it's going to be and should be. Um, and that is where we find Peter in this story today. And that is why we just sang this last hymn, Lord, transfigure our perception with the purest light that shines, and recast our life's intentions to the shape of your designs, till we seek no other glory than what lies past Calvary's hill, and are living and are dying and are rising by your will. The transfiguration is something that is really hard to get into um, and understand because it is so other. But if we are going to be able to follow where God calls us and where Jesus leads, then we're going to need much more of God than we typically allow to come into our lives or we typically think of. And so this is a moment where I'm asking that we set some time aside um, to make room in our schedules um, for God to break through in a way that we can listen and we can hear. And I would like to share with you um, a chapter from the book, The Shack, because um, it is one that helps me the most and being able to think about what this transfiguration could have been like um, and how to allow that more into our lives. Um, I was away this week um, for a little bit at West River. And do you have the YouTube video, Barry? Did it come through? Okay. If you could put up those lobed jellyfish, lobe combs, um, that I had no idea existed, but are basically like um, God's um, disco ball to the ocean, um, then we can start um, into this meditation. So these are real organisms that are about that big, but their babies are about that big, and they were all over the L dock at West River filling it so it looked like all of the lights, if you've ever seen Andy Thornton, the director there, describes it like get tangled when all of those lights go up in the movie. Um, so if God can make that much light out of one little organism that big, think of what the disciples were seeing when all of Jesus was transfigured um, in front of them and all that is possible. There's so much more out there than we know or realize. And so here is our character, Mac, from the shack, finding a little bit of that more that is out there. Um, when this is over, if you could close your eyes and just give space um, for this. Papa again interrupted. You see, Mackenzie, I don't just want a piece of you and a piece of your life. Even if you were able, which you are not, to give me the biggest piece that is not what I want. 
I want all of you and all of every part of you and your day. Jesus now spoke again. Mac, I don't want to be first among a list of values. I want to be at the center of everything. When I live in you, then together we can live through everything that happens to you. Rather than the top of a pyramid, I want to be the center of a mobile, where everything in your life, your friends, family, occupation, thoughts, activities, is connected to me, but moves with the wind in and out and back and forth in an incredible dance of being. And I, in concluded Sarayu, am the wind. She smiled and bowed. We have our introduction to the characters of the Trinity in this story. Mackenzie, if you would allow me, this is Sarayu speaking, I would like to give you a gift for this evening. May I touch your eyes and heal them just for tonight? Mac was surprised. I see well enough, don't I? Actually, Sarayu said apologetically, you see very little, even though for a human you see fairly well. But just for tonight, I would love you to see a bit of what we see, then by all means. And as she reached her hands toward him, Matt closed his eyes and leaned forward. Her touch was like ice. Unexpected and exhilarating, a delicious shiver went through him. And he reached up to hold her hands to his face. But there was nothing there. So he slowly began to open his eyes. And he immediately shielded them from a blinding light that overwhelmed him. Then he heard something. You will find it very difficult to look at me directly, said the voice of Sarayu, or at Papa. But as your mind becomes accustomed to the changes, it will be easier. He was standing right where he had closed his eyes, but the shack was gone, as were the dock and shop. Instead, he was outside, perched on the top of a small hill under a brilliant but moonless night sky. He could see that the stars were in motion, not hurriedly, but smoothly and with precision, as if there were grand celestial conductors coordinating their movements. Occasionally, as if on cue, comets and meteor showers would tumble through the starry ranks, adding variation to the flowing dance. Then Max saw some of the stars grow and change color, as if they were turning nova or white dwarf. It was as if time itself had become dynamic and volatile, adding to the seemingly chaotic but precisely managed heavenly display. It's all so incredibly beautiful, he whispered, surrounded as he was by such a holy and majestic sight. Truly, said the voice of Sarayu from out of the light, now Mackenzie. Look around. He did and gasped. Even in the darkness of the night, everything had clarity and shone with halos of life and various hues and shades of color. The forest itself was afire with light and color, yet each tree was distinctly visible. Each branch, each leaf. Birds and bats created a trail of colored fire as they flew or chased one another. He could even see that in the distance an army of creation was in attendance, deer and bear and mountain sheep and majestic elk near the edges of the forest, otter and beaver in the lake, each shining its own colors and blaze. Myriads of little creatures scampered and darted everywhere, each alive with its own glory. In a rush of peach and plum and currant flames, an osprey dove toward the surface of the lake and pulled up at the last instant to skim across its surface, sparks from its wings falling like snow into the waters as it passed. Behind it, a large rainbow-clothed lake trout burst through the surface as if to taunt a passing hunter and then dropped back in in a mist and splash of colors. Then Mark saw the lights, single moving points emerging from the forest, converging upon the meadow below where he and Sarayu stood. He could see them now, high up on the surrounding mountains, appearing and disappearing as they made their way toward them, down unseen paths and trails. They broke into the meadow, an army of children. There were no candles. They themselves were lights. 
And within their own radiance, each was dressed in a distinctive garb that Mac imagined represented every tribe and tongue. For a moment, Mac wondered if Missy, his daughter, might be there. And although he looked for a minute, he gave up. He settled within himself that if she were, and if she wanted to run to him, she would. The children had now formed a huge circle within the meadow, with a path left open from near where Mac stood into the very center. Little bursts of fire and light, like a stadium of slow-popping flashbulbs, ignited when the children would giggle or whisper. Even though Mac had no idea what was going on, they obviously did, and the anticipation was almost too much for them. Suddenly, Mac's attention was caught by an unusual motion. It appeared that one of the lights be light beings in the outer circle was having some difficulty. Flashes and spears of violet and ivory would arc briefly into the night in their direction. As these retreated, they were replaced by orchid gold and flaming vermilion, burning and brilliant sprays of radiance that burst out again toward them, flaming against immediate darkness, only to subside and return to their source. Surayu chuckled. What's going on? Mac whispered. There is a man here who is having some difficulty keeping in what he is feeling. I still don't understand, Mac whispered again. Mackenzie, the pattern of color and light is unique to each person. No two are alike and no pattern is ever the same. Twice. Here we are able to see one another truly, and part of seeing means that individual personality and emotion are visible in color and in light. That's incredible! As you near them, the kids, you will see that they have many different individual colors that have merged into white, which contains all. As they mature and grow to become who they really are, the colors they exhibit will become more distinctive and unique hues and shades will emerge. Even to Mac, it was obvious that the man, whoever he was, back to this guy, was continuing to have difficulty. Sirayu explains, not only are we able to see the uniqueness of one another in color and light, but we are able to respond through the same medium. But this response is very difficult to control, and it is usually not intended to be restrained, as this one is attempting. It is most natural just to let its expression be. Each relationship between two persons is absolutely unique. That is why you cannot love two people the same. It is simply not possible. You love each person differently because of who they are and the uniqueness that they draw out of you. And the more you know one another, the richer the colors of that relationship. And one more thing. It is not only visual, but sensual as well. You can feel, smell, and even taste that uniqueness. So then why, Max attention, returned back to the troublemaker, why is that one having so much difficulty and why does he seem so focused on us? Mackenzie, Surayu said gently, he's not focused on us, but he's focused on you. The one having so much trouble containing himself, that one is your father. A wave of emotions, a mixture of anger and longings washed over Mac, and as if on cue, his father's colors burst from across the meadow and enveloped him. He was lost in a wash of ruby and vermilion, magenta and violet, as the light and color whirled around and embraced him. And somehow, in the middle of the exploding storm, he found himself running across the meadow to find his father, running toward the source of the colors and emotions. He was a little boy wanting his daddy. And for the first time, he was not afraid. He was running, not caring for anything, but the object of his heart, and he found him. His father was on his knees, awash in light, tears sparkling like a waterfall of diamonds and jewels into the hands that covered his face. Daddy, yelled Mac, and he threw himself onto the man who could not even look at his son. In the howl of wind and flame, Mac took his father's face in his two hands, forcing his dad to look him in the face so he could stammer the words he had always wanted to say. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Daddy, I love you. 
The light of his word seemed to blast the darkness out of his father's colors, turning them blood red. They exchanged sobbing words of confession and forgiveness as a love greater than either one healed them. Finally, they were able to stand together, a father holding his son as he had never been able to do before. It was then that Mac noticed the swell of a song that washed over them both as it penetrated the holy place where he stood with his father. With arms around each other, they listened, unable to speak through the tears to the song of reconciliation that lit the night sky. An arcing fountain of brilliant color began among the children, especially those who had suffered the greatest, and then rippled as if passed from one to the next by the wind until the entire field was flooded with light and song. Kissing his father on the lips, he returned and made his way back to the small hill where Sarayu stood waiting for him. As he passed through the ranks of the children, he could feel their touches and colors quickly embrace him and fall away. Somehow, he was already known. Somehow, he was already loved here. When he reached Sarayu, she embraced him as well, and he let her just hold him as he continued to cry. When he had regained some semblance of coherence, he turned to look back at the meadow, the lake, and the night sky. A hush descended, and the anticipation was palpable. Suddenly, to their right and from out of the darkness emerged Jesus, and pandemonium broke out. He was dressed in a simple, brilliant white garment and wore on his head a simple gold crown, but he was every inch the king of the universe. He walked to the path that opened before him into the center, the center of all creation, the man who is God and the God who is man. Light and color danced and wove a tapestry of love for him to step on. Some were crying out words of love while others simply stood with hands lifted up. Many of those whose colors were the richest and deepest were lying flat on their faces. Everything that had a breath sang out a song of an ending love and thankfulness tonight. The universe was as it was intended. And as Jesus reached the center, he paused to look around. His gaze stopped on Mac. His gaze stopped on you. Standing on the small hill at the outer edge, what would it mean to hear Jesus whisper in our ear, Mac, son, daughter, I am especially fond of you. That was all Matt could bear as he slumped to the ground, dissolving into a wash of joyful tears. He couldn't move, gripped as he was in Jesus' embrace of love and tenderness. He then heard Jesus clearly and loudly say, but oh, so gently and invitingly, come, and they did. The children first and then the adults, each in turn for as long as they needed to laugh and to talk and to embrace and to sing with their Jesus. Time seemed to have completely stopped as the celestial dance and display continued. And each in turn then left until none remained except the burning blue sentinels and the animals. Even these Jesus walked among, calling each by name until they and their young turned to make their way back to dens and nests and bedding pastures. Max stood motionless trying to absorb this experience that was beyond his and our ability to capture. I had no idea, he whispered, shaking his head and gazing into the distance. Unbelievable. Sarayu laughed a shower of colors. Just imagine, Mackenzie, if I had touched not only your eyes, but also your tongue and your nose and your ears. Finally, they were alone once more. The wild, haunting cry of a loon echoing across the lake seemed to signal the end of the celebration, and the sentinels vanished in unison. The only sound remaining was the chorus of crickets and frogs resuming their own songs of worship from out of the water's edge and the surrounding meadows. Without a word, 
the three turned and walked back toward the shack, which had again become visible to Mac. Like a curtain being drawn across his eyes, he was suddenly blind again. His vision returned to normal. He felt a loss and a longing and even a little sad until Jesus came alongside and took his hand, squeezing it to let Mac know that everything was as it should be. On that night and on that mountain, we remember the disciples falling down in fear. And we remember Jesus coming to them to touch their shoulder, to take away their fear, and to walk down the mountain with them. May this Lenten journey be one that we can do with a glimpse of who God is and can be and the fear that God can melt away, the love that God can give and the courage that God can weave in the very depths of our bodies and our souls. May this Lenten journey be one where we can taste and see, smell and hear, and know the more that God is, a more that we and that our world desperately 